Okie dokie. Connecting now. Let's let people come in. Yeah, I'll let folks can begin to trickle in. Hello, everyone. I'll just give a second here before I introduce Dr. Jane Hong. Oh, great. I'm seeing folks in the chat box. Very nice. Thank you all for jumping into the next session. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Jane Hong, who is Associate Professor of History at Occidental College and the author of Opening the Gates to Asia, a Trans-Pacific History of How America Repealed Asian Exclusion. Her current project, under contract with Oxford University Press, considers how post-1965 Asian immigration has changed U.S. evangelical institutions and politics. A publicly engaged historian, Jane has led seminars for the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History, consulted for TV programs such as Finding Your Roots with Henry Louis Gates, and penned op-eds for the Washington Post and the Los Angeles Times. She also appears in the PBS docuseries Asian Americans. Jane received her PhD in history from Harvard and her BA from Yale. And I will post her book and podcast information in the chat box. Welcome, Jane. The floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. So greetings from Los Angeles, <clears throat> where it is quite early in the morning, so my voice might catch a little. Uh, apologies in advance. I want to thank David, the steering committee, all the organizers, uh, my fellow speakers and presenters, and all of you here today for taking this time on a Monday morning, uh, on a Friday morning, uh, to spend even more time on Zoom than we all are uh, these days. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very grateful for your presence as part of this important conversation. So today, I'm going to talk about the Asian American movement of the late 1960s and 1970s, <clears throat> focusing on the role that Christians played in this movement and its influence on the US church. I realize that for many of you, some of what I share will be new, uh, since unless you took an Asian American history class in college or grad school, uh, you likely didn't learn much about this movement or perhaps much about Asian Americans at all. Uh, I grew up in New Jersey and I went to college and grad school in the Northeast. Uh, the first time I heard about the Asian American movement was junior year of college in an Asian American history class. And I heard nothing about it in graduate school. Um, so I had to seek out that information on my own. So, but as a testament to how important this movement was, let me just say, it's likely we wouldn't be sitting here today having this conference on Asian American theology if this movement hadn't done the work to institutionalize Asian American studies as an academic field with a dedicated curriculum, faculty jobs, and a whole scholarly literature. Uh, without the work of these movement activists, it's possible that I wouldn't be a professor studying Asian immigration. And I suspect this may also be true for some of the other speakers here today. So I would argue that this movement was quite important in many different ways for many different people. So what was the Asian American movement? Um, according to scholar Dara Maida, it was a social movement for racial justice that brought together people of various a Asian ancestries in the United States who protested against racism and US imperialism. Movement activists demanded changes in institutions such as colleges and universities. They organized workers and sought to provide social services such as housing, food, and healthcare to the underserved. Importantly, the movement was never intended to be a standalone effort. Core to its mission, it practiced coalitional politics, emphasizing solidarity among Asians of all ethnicities, multiracial solidarity between Asian Americans, Black Americans, Latinx, and First Nations peoples, and even transnational solidarity with peoples around the globe being impacted by US militarism. In the case of the 1960s, most notably, the Vietnamese people. A small group of scholars has explored the role that Asian American Christians and church leaders in particular played in the Asian American movement. And here I draw from the work of Helen Jin Kim, Karen Yonemoto, and Justin C, among others. <clears throat> 
They have noted how the Asian American movement is often seen as secular or even antithetical to Christianity because of its connections to black power and anti-Vietnam War protest. Some leaders um, claimed influence by Marxism and Maoism, for example. But just as Christians and other Americans of faith were important to other movements of this period, including the civil rights movement, um, there were Christians involved in these more radical movements as well. And when asked about their motivations for getting involved, some cited the influence of the social gospel movement of the early 20th century and its emphasis on addressing the ills of society. Some Asian American Christians also referenced their own experiences with American racism and state-sponsored injustice. Two such church leaders were Lloyd Wake and Roy Sano, two Japanese American clergy who later became bishops within the United Methodist Church. Their, their involvement reminds us that Asian Americans of faith were part of these movements. They supported from the sidelines and they also marched firsthand. They were UMC pastors deeply influenced by their families and communities experiences with World War II incarceration. When the US government rounded up and incarcerated 120,000 Japanese Americans along the West Coast for the duration of World War II. So roughly between 1942 um, and 1945, though some folks stayed in camp through 1946. Waka and Sana were among the many U.S. born Japanese Americans to be incarcerated. Um, and in fact, two thirds of those in the camps were U.S. born citizens. Their experience of state spots of incarceration shaped their theology and their firm belief that their ethnic and racial identities not only matter to God, but that their identity should also inform how they do ministry, how they teach the Bible, and how they engage society. And for many of us, being Asian American at the time of COVID-19 and an epidemic of anti-Asian violence, this might be the closest we've come to an experience remotely like World War II incarceration, um, of experiencing that level of racialized hypervisibility, scapegoating, and fears disrupting our everyday lives. My very modest goal or hope as a historian is to suggest that as you consider how to engage with today's conversations about and movements for justice, that first you need to understand where you fit in the histories that have created and shaped the world we live in and the historically white structures and institutions in which many of us are deeply embedded and which may have shaped us in how we think in ways that we may or may not recognize readily. So the Asian American movement began in the spring of 1968 with the founding of APA, Asian American Political Alliance in Berkeley, California. Inspired by the other identity movements at the time, Asian American political alliance members, APA members, coined the term Asian American. In the words of activist Chris Ajima, it was an organizing tool to mobilize Asians to participate in the progressive movements of the time. And here I'll just show you a longer quote, though I can't read all of it. It was less a marker of what one said and more a marker of what one believed. Um, and this quote was taken from an interview that Chris Ajima did later after the movement um, and kind of reflecting upon how the term Asian American has changed and how its uses have changed over time. So APA members believed that there was value in pan-Asian solidarity and in solidarity with other racialized communities. To them, Asian American wasn't just simply a descriptor, it was a political project, a choice in the pursuit of liberation and self-determination. And let me just say, self-determination might sound lofty, but it just meant that they wanted the ability to decide their own futures. Um, including things like if they applied for a job outside of Chinatown, Little Tokyo, or Japantown, the idea that they would have had an actual shot um, at employment after decades of structural barriers to employment of Asian Americans. Or if they tried to buy a house in a, in a majority white neighborhood, that they wouldn't be inhibited or held back by restrictive covenants or discriminatory lending practices. So there were structural barriers as well as interpersonal experiences of racism. This picture is from Berkeley. Um, at San Francisco State, APA members, along with the Intercollegiate Chinese for Social Action and Filipino American Collegiate Endeavor, uh, joined with Black and Latinx students to form the Third World Liberation Front. Together, they fought for the creation of an ethnic studies college with regular courses and faculty. Affiliated chapters began similar protests across the Bay here um, at UC Berkeley. And I think this is Telegraph, uh, this is Telegraph Avenue for those of you who know the campus. So these two actions in SF and Berkeley became two of the longest student strikes in American history. And a few notes about the broader context, because historians love context, um, and this moment in US history that might be important to know. 
First, in 1968, Asian Americans remained an incredibly small minority within the US, thanks in large part to a longer history of Asian exclusion. Um, so in fact, you could argue a, a big part of the reason why APA members decided to organize was precisely because of the small population. They believed there was strength in numbers. Significantly, it's because of Asian exclusion laws that the Asian American population in the US remains extremely low and grows very slowly before the 1960s. And here you get a sense right, of just how slowly the growth happens. And a lot of that growth came from US born Asian Americans, so the children and grandchildren of immigrants. Many of us have heard of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Some of us might have learned for the first time about the Page Law in the wake of the Atlanta shootings um, in March. But fewer people realize that Congress actually expands US exclusion laws to bar all long-term immigration from Asia by 1924. Um, the one exception were Filipinos who were exempted because the Philippines was a US colony, uh, but they too come under restriction in 1934. These exclusion laws get repealed during World War II and the early Cold War, and that's the topic of my first book. Um, but it's not really, right, so initially Congress passes symbolic repeal measures that give Asians small immigration quotas of between 100 and 185 per year and U.S. citizenship eligibility. Um, but because until 1952, Asians were actually racially barred from naturalizing as U.S. citizens. But it's not until the 1965 Immigration Act that Asians are able to immigrate to the U.S. in large numbers for the first time. And here I'll go through these slides more quickly. Just to give you a sense, right, of when the biggest growth in the Asian American population happens, um, a lot of it happens in the 1980s, the 1990s, right? And again, this is because of the 1965 Immigration Act. This is part of a larger trend and shift whereby the 65 Immigration Act uh, creates a majority Asian and Latinx immigration stream to the US. Uh, before 1965, up to 90% of immigrants actually came from Europe. The 1965 Act also allows for a dramatic increase in the number or in the number of Asians coming from places outside of China and Japan. So it's really the post-65 immigration waves as well as post-Vietnam refugee migrations that greatly diversify who makes up Asian America. So the 65 law creates a larger, more diverse Asian America, in many ways the one that we have today. The Asian American movement happens during a brief window of time when US born Asian Americans outnumber foreign born. In the 1960s, Japanese Americans were by far the largest Asian American community. Chinese Americans were a distant second. And so for the folks who were involved in the Asian American movement, these are largely US born Japanese and Chinese Americans, some Filipino Americans and some Korean Americans as well. Um, the second and third generation, they grew up, they went to college in places like California, they experienced racism firsthand, again, both structural and interpersonal. They could see the barriers, right, the structural barriers to employment, housing. They could see how racism constrained their opportunities and their lives and the lives of their families in very real ways. And as they learned more about their own histories of racial exclusion, this fostered a greater sense of solidarity with other racialized peoples in the US and around the world. And for many of these younger Asian Americans, um, they took issue with how Asian Americans were being used against other people of color, specifically black Americans, with the newly popular idea of the model minority, which becomes increasingly um, well known during the 1960s. And here again, context is really important. So the term model minority, there is a longer history, but the term can be traced back to two articles published in 1966 this is a few months after the Watts riots in LA, amid the Black Power Movement and racial unrest or race riots, people called them, um, in cities across the US. If you take a look at these two articles, New York Times, January 9th, 1966, William Peterson is a Berkeley sociologist, so he's writing this piece right in the middle um, of Berkeley and Oakland, um, as there is racial unrest happening in those places. In both cases, the authors use Japanese and Chinese American success to critique and hypothesize about why African Americans haven't achieved similar levels of success. And if you just take a look at the quote, you can read it um, for yourself. The articles are ostensibly about Chinese and Japanese Americans, but these discussions are couched in broader arguments about African Americans. Um, and this is why many scholars argue that the model minority isn't actually about Asian Americans. And what you see, again, are 
kind of writers and others using Asian Americans to make a point or to make arguments about, about African American poverty, about black struggle, um, about black urban core, cultures of poverty. And there is some mention of structural factors like slavery and Jim Crow, but these, these articles largely focus on cultural factors. And the argument is Japanese and Chinese Americans have the right cultural practices conducive to success, while black Americans handicap themselves and are responsible in many ways for their own, for their own plight. In our last few minutes, I'm just going to briefly overview um, the involvement of Lloyd Wake and Boris Sano. So they're both young. Um, Lloyd Wake was barely 20, uh, and I think Roy Sano was in his early teens when they were both incarcerated at the post in camp um, during World War II with their families. Both left the camps and attended um, Christian colleges, both right trained, went into ministry full time. And for them, their experiences of incarceration compelled them to reconcile their ethnic identity and consciousness with their theological views. So what did it mean to be not just a Christian, but a Japanese American Christian, um, seeking to rejoin society and rebuild their destroyed community after an unjust state-sponsored incarceration? Rather than see their involvement in the Asian American movement and justice movements as antithetical or contradicting their faith beliefs, um, they saw it as an extension or a part of their faith witness as Asian American Christian leaders. And as Wake explained it, quote, real religion was about doing justice and living out one's commitment to a better society. And the church's role was to serve as an institutional means toward that end. So by the time the Asian American movement begins, Wake was in his mid forties, Sano was in his late thirties. So about two decades or more older than most of the other activists they are marching alongside. So they marched in the protests themselves. And here you have um, an image of Roy Sano at one of the protests. Uh, he's the one wearing the sign on the bottom left. Um, they also you know, participated in other ways. Lloyd Wake was, he sought to be a bridge builder for the Japanese American community who was trying to mediate between different factions. Um, so older Japanese Americans who were really critical of um, the younger generation's involvement in these movements and these protests. Um, and you know, I've interviewed activists from the 1960s, many of them themselves not Christian, who remember Lloyd Wake and his presence at these community forums where he really was able to mediate um, between the different generations. And Wake was widely res respected and trusted, right? And so folks knew, right, if, that they were clergy, but they trusted them and they were invited and welcome as part of the movement. Um, a couple things I'll just mention. So it is significant that both Wake and Sano uh, they were not serving Japanese American congregations at the time that they both became directly involved. That's one thing that Wake writes about um, in his later um, kind of recollections about his involvement in the movement. Uh, Roy Sano was in an academic role at Mills College at the time. They both belonged to mainline denomination that generally supported black civil rights activism and student protests during this period. Um, the protests, the Third World Liberation Front protests ultimately were successful, um, but at a cost. At SF State, um, police and National Guard were sent in to disrupt the protests. Students were beaten and bloodied, arrests were made. And you saw similar conflict and violence at UC Berkeley where some students were beaten unconscious, put in jail. Um, but in 1969, following months of protests, UC Berkeley administrators founded the first Department of Ethnic Studies and SF State followed suit a few weeks later. And both schools still have robust ethnic studies departments that again, were in many ways a direct result of these protests staged in 1968 and 1969. Um, very importantly, however, Wake and Sano and other Asian American Christian leaders, they didn't just stop here. And so where I'll wrap up is, you know, Sano, Wake, um, Wilbur Choi, there are many, many other names I could, I could list here. These were church leaders who wanted to bring the ideas of the Asian American movement and ethnic studies into the church, into the curriculum of seminaries, and into the leadership structures and organizations of mainline Protestant denominations. Um, so they really, you know, one of their main calls was for ethnic caucuses that can empower ethnic minority leaders within the church and bring ethnic consciousness to bear on how seminaries and churches taught theology, both academic theology as well as lived theology. And so that's where this organization PAX um, came from, Pacific Asian American Center for Theology and Strategies. Um, and PAX you know, was part of the effort that successfully won the creation of ethnic specific caucuses, conferences, and organizations 
within many mainline denominations. These are just a few of the examples. Um, and, and, you know, again, their work remains with us today in that many of these organizations, um, these caucuses, these conferences still exist, um, although there's been several changes. I know for the American Baptists, um, the American, the Asian American Baptist Caucus recently became the Alliance of Asian American Baptists, an equal partner uh, with the denom denomination. You know, and in closing, I'll say that this was a story about the mainline church. Um, but, you know, the other thing that was happening during this period was the decline of the mainline churches and denominations and the rise of evangelical churches and denominations, driven in part by new immigrants coming from Asia under the 1965 Immigration Act. And part of what I'm doing in my second book is thinking about how these same ideas of the Asian American movement influenced Asian American evangelicals and their community organizations, and how Asian American evangelicals changed historically white institutions and organizations um, in many ways similar to the way that their mainline, their peers in the mainline churches did. And I'd be happy to talk more about that project in the Q&A or address whatever other questions folks may have. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. I will keep my eye on the Q&A chat as people uh, reflect upon Jane's presentation and um, frame some questions. And um, be before I get to the chat question, so Jane, part of what I heard in your in your presentation was the experience of Japanese incarceration was fairly important for shaping the drive for justice for the, the two leaders, uh, Wake and Sano, that you mentioned. And again, that's consistent with the majority of Asian Americans in the 60s were US born as opposed to foreign born. Um, and they were both mainline and both Methodist. And so that's that's extremely interesting. Another observation I drew from your presentation was if the civil rights movement um, and sort of the, the black freedom movement centered in the US South, then it seems like the Asian American liberation movement is centered in California, specifically Northern California, which makes sense if there's a certain density of Asian American leadership and experience on the West Coast. What other motivations does your research indicate for American Christians pursuing justice? So first, let me just clarify, and this is something I meant to mention, so I'm really glad you brought it up, David. So the Asian American movement, I think it does really begin in many ways in the San Francisco Bay Area, and it's centered in San Francisco and Berkeley, um, but there are similar kind of movement protests in various places across the country. So you have APA chapters, for example, in New York City, Chicago, Hawaii. And there are efforts in New York City, for example, to bring ethnic studies to the CUNY system. Um, there are activists in Chicago who are also um, protesting and kind of striking there. And in Hawaii, I know there was an effort to bring similar kinds of classes to um, University of Hawaii at Manoa. So I think let me just say it is a national movement, um, even though a lot of the kind of um, attention is given to the Bay Area. I mean, I think that, you know, again, and this is something that we I'm sure we'll talk a lot about. Right. Asian America today is incredibly diverse, over 50 groups, linguistic groups, ethnic groups. In the 1960s, it is Asian America is more so Japanese and Chinese American predominantly. Um, I mean, Japanese Americans have a particular history where the incarceration really does shape. Um, a lot of how they think about their faith. Um, Chinese Americans have different motivations, right, for getting involved. And even um, and even within these ethnic communities, obviously, different individuals have different motives for getting involved. I know that for um, Filipino and Korean Americans, for example, in the 1970s, especially, there was a lot of interest in pro-democracy movements. And so you have Asian American movement activists, including Roy Sano himself, so the Bishop Roy Sano in the late, mid to late 1970s gets really involved in pro-democracy movements that are targeting um, dictators like Ferdinand Marcos, the Marcos family in the Philippines and Pak Jong-hee in Korea. And so you see um, Asian American movement activists getting involved in these kind of trans-Pacific pro-democracy movements where you have, you know, Korean Americans, Filipino Americans, um, other Asian Americans joining with kind of their kind of fellow activists overseas. And there's actually a, a story, and I'll just mention this briefly, um, 
so Tim Sang, historian Tim Sang and I co-host are co-hosting a, a season of Centering podcast um, hosted by the Fuller Asian American Center. And we interviewed Bishop Sano for one of our episodes. So I'd really, um, I would really encourage folks to take a listen to that piece. At the very end of that conversation, Bishop Sano talks about how he actually travels back and forth between Korea, the Philippines and the United States. Um, and he becomes kind of a liaison taking messages from the US-based pro-democracy activists to their counterparts in the Philippines and Korea, um, trying to kind of give aid to this pro-democracy movement because there was a lot of there was a lot of suppression and repression. Um, and there were a lot of limits on what Koreans and Filipinos in the United States felt comfortable doing um, in terms of uh, protesting uh, those dictatorial regimes in Asia. So there are many different motivations and and there are also many different kind of aspects um, and dimensions to the Asian American movement. So I just highlighted one in particular. But over the 1970s, the movement movement activists are involved in many different um, issues and causes. So I want to invite Darren, my co-host, to ask a, a question or two. We're mindful of the time. I'll just maybe um, I'll ask one briefly that I saw in the chat. Uh, Jane, do you think Wake and Sano are representative or were they exceptional? So that's one question. And Darren, why don't you unmute and ask a question and Jane can take her pick of what she feels like answering in the short amount of time we have. Darren, you're muted. I think, yeah. So we have audio issues. I can't hear you yet, Darren. Let's try again. No, I, I don't hear Darren. So maybe Jane, you can address um, how how Wake and Sano were representative or, or not? I mean, it's a good question. And well, I think in my research, so the PAX, right, the organization I mentioned has a whole archive that's very accessible to the public. Um, it's, it's at Berkeley, um, in Berkeley at the um, GTU, the Graduate Theological Seminary or Graduate Theological Union, um, right near UC Berkeley campus. I think in terms of numbers, um, I don't have the full numbers, but I guess I, in terms of my impressions, I was actually surprised by the number of people who were involved in these efforts. Um, and I think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, my own research focuses on evangelicals during this period, so the 1960s and 1970s. So there is a mainline story. And the other thing I should say is mainline and evangelical, there's a lot more porousness between these um, groups or organizations or, or communities during the 1970s. This is really before evangelical becomes a political or partisan term. That's a late 1970s moral mi majority Jerry Falwell story, which I could talk more about at a different time. And I wanted to talk about, but didn't have time today. I mean, so I think that, I guess what I'll say is, I was surprised by the number of Asian American Christians across evangelical and mainline communities who were influenced by the ideas of the Asian American movement. And so the last thing, the one example I'll give is um, in my first chapter, the first chapter of my second book, I talk about um, Agape Fellowship, which was an Asian American Christian commune founded by evangelicals largely in, the, in Los Angeles. Um, and there has been some attention to this group, but they were influenced by the Jesus movement and they were really, um, they believed in right this kind of ethnic and racial consciousness and they we're really engaged in community outreach and community service to places like Little Tokyo, serving different underserved Asian American communities in the Los Angeles area. And their Christian faith was really the driver for that. And there's a lot more I could say about that organization. Ken Fong has two episodes of his podcast, I think about Agape. It's a lot more I could say, but yeah, I think I was just, I, I think I was struck just by how Asian Americans during this period, they saw their ethnic and racial identities as really interconnected, right, and, and kind of inevitably connected with um, their religious faith, their, their Christian faith. And I think it really shaped their activism um, in concrete ways. Thank you, Jane. I'm going to end this session. I've noticed a lot of fantastic questions in the Q&A. Uh, folks can ask those again during the panel discussion in the next at, at 11 a.m. And I just want to thank Jane for an excellent presentation. And I think your comment about this Agape Jesus movement, we can pick that up in the panel discussion time as well. So I will conclude this session and we will open the next session with Melissa Borja, scheduled originally for 10.30. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Jane. Thank you.